Hello, everyone. Um, as Scott said, I am um, clinical adjunct faculty at the Eye and Vision Center at MTPHS University School of Optometry. Um, so today I thought I would come at this from the point of a low vision exam since that's uh, what my specialty is. So simply stated, functional vision to me is the way that the body's visual system, which includes the eye and the brain, interacts with the surroundings in order to accomplish activities of daily living. Now, for those of us who are essentially normally sighted, um, the visual system works pretty well to accomplish these activities. For those patients who have a visual impairment um, or any degree of um, uh, visual loss, the system doesn't work so well. So that's where we all come into play. Um, along with a multidisciplinary group team, uh, which you are a part of, I imagine, um, it includes physician, physicians, OTs who are trained in vision rehab, uh, orientation and mobility instructors, assistive technology specialists like here at New England Low Vision, um, TVIs, social workers, and the list can go on. So that's really the model that I like to follow when I'm referring patients out for additional help. So I thought that I would kind of bring you into the clinic and tell you how we approach um, our new low vision patients. Um, because a lot of times they come in and they really don't know why they're there. They think it's a regular eye exam and we need to explain to them exactly what's going to happen. Um, so I usually begin by welcoming them and tell telling them that their referring doctor thought that they would benefit from a low vision exam um, which I think is synonymous with a functional vision exam. And I tell them that it's a little bit different exam. Some of the things that we do will be very familiar to them, but other tests and data that we collect um, will be a bit different. So what's the difference? Well, if you come in for a routine eye exam, like most of you have probably had, um, the emphasis is not only correcting your vision with a pair of glasses, but it's an ocular health assessment, looking at the health of the eye, looking for disease, treating disease. Um, this is a little bit different because our focus is not primarily on that. Uh, we want to be able to spend most of our time on the functional vision aspect. So we don't spend a whole lot of time, time dilating patients and looking at health assessment. I kind of leave that to uh, the referring doctors. So having said that to the patient, um, I tell them that our goal, uh, and these exams are very goal oriented for us and the patient, is to help them see the best they can to do what they want to do and what they need to do. Um, now, visual acuity doesn't always correlate to visual function, as a lot of you probably know. Um, we can have patients in the clinic whose vision you would think is pretty good, 2020 to 2040, even 2070. 2070 allows you to drive daytime in Massachusetts, so why should a patient have a problem? Um, but there are things that can occur in their functional day-to-day -day lives that are interrupted because of another impairment. So they may have decreased contrast sensitivity, and that may be because they have glaucoma. Um, they may have field cuts because they have suffered a stroke, yet their central vision is still 2020 or 2016. Um, they may have photophobia because they've had a traumatic brain injury or have suffered a concussion. So we see patients, you know, with very seemingly normal vision all the way to patients who um, have been uh, registered as legally blind. So the ultimate goal, again, is to meet the goals of our patients. And patients have a lot of different goals. And we usually start by asking them, if they can't enumerate what their goals are, 
um, what it is that they're having difficulty with. And we usually start with the near vision. Um, there's a lot of tasks that may be giving them difficulty, simply reading. That's usually at the top of everyone's list. Uh, reading tags, labels, menus, mail, newspaper, church bulletins, you name it, um, patients will have difficulty in this area. Distance vision, they're having trouble seeing the TV, seeing faces, driving, signs, signs in stores, the fast food menu at a um, Starbucks or a McDonald's, um, signs, aisle signs in the grocery store. They may have things that are bothering them as far as lighting goes. They may uh, be bothered by too much light, too little light, harsh glare, decreased contrast. Um, and they may have trouble ambulating because not only their field loss, but also their acuity. The one thing I do try to do um, right at the beginning of, of the exam is temper expectations about glasses. Now, everyone comes to the clinic and they want the magic glasses, and we would love to give them that. And so I explain to patients that our first and foremost goal is to give them the best prescription that we can. But I emphasize the fact that it's not always about glasses. Glasses will only do so much, and if, they, if they're enough to achieve their goal, that's great, but if they're not, and I try to keep it positive here, that's the reason that they're here, because we take the next step. We offer devices, strategies, techniques, whatever it takes to help them do what they would like to do in their activities of daily living. Um, now, I can go through the full exam and show them every device in our arsenal. Um, and ultimately, there are times where they say to me, but you're going to give me a new pair of glasses, right? So that's always a little frustrating. I know we probably have all heard that. Um, but again, I try to keep it positive and show them the things that will help them. Um, a big, well, I would say the most important thing sometimes, and it, and it sometimes sounds really simplistic, but lighting is often a patient's best friend. I mean, we can all appreci appreciate good lighting. And I tell the students this all the time, um, that just instructing the patient on how to use good direct illumination can sometimes be the only thing that we do for a patient, but it makes a huge difference. So they hear me see, say time and time again, okay, Mrs. Jones, you can't rely on your nice overhead lighting um, or your pretty side lamps. Oh, but I just got the new LED lights in there everywhere in my home. I'm saying, yes, that's great, but you need a light pointed directly on what you're looking at, perpendicular to your reading material. And we demonstrate that to them. And lo and behold, the newspaper all, all of a sudden becomes readable. And I know it sounds so simple, but sometimes that's all it takes. The other thing that I tell the students, students time and time again is never underestimate the power of a filter or a tint. Um, so what do tints do? Well, if a patient is scoring poorly on a contrast sensitivity test, we know that maybe introducing a tint, particularly a yellow tint in most cases, will help increase contrast. So all of a sudden that newspaper, which is kind of gray on gray, becomes more readable because we've increased contrast with a yellow tint. Um, a TBI patient or a post-concussion patient typically will favor a blue tint because it makes them more comfortable. Um, I always tell the story about um, a patient of ours who came in and she had macular degeneration and every time she went into a big box store the overall uh, the overhead lighting was just so harsh she she just couldn't manage it it was just too too distressful for her to be in a store so we tried some of our FL41s uh, which is kind of a light plum tint for those of you that aren't familiar with it um, but any of the light plum tints usually work pretty well. And she came back for her follow-up, and um, 
she was practically in tears and she said, you've changed my life. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm glad. So what, did, what device is, no, no, it wasn't the device. It was that tint you gave me because now I can go into a store and I'm comfortable. I can do what I need to do. And that was just such a great example for the students that it, sometimes it's the simple things that make the biggest difference. Um, we, we also have a, a lot of our patients, particularly with macular degeneration, who say to me, gee, you know, I can't sign my name on a straight line. I go uphill, I go downhill. I can't do my checks because it's all over the place. I can't write a list out for my daughter to go grocery shopping because it's such a mess. Well, you know, we've got all this technology, but the one simple thing that makes a difference is a signature guide, which you know, some of you may be familiar with, uh, some of us call it typoscopes, but it's just this little window that you place on a straight line so that the patient can write their name straight uh, or make a list straight. So again, a lot of this is simple. Um, it, it certainly gets a bit more complicated uh, when we start introducing devices, but we do, we do try to keep it simple at first. So one of the things that I'm pretty adamant about, um, I would really like my colleagues and physicians and teachers, anyone who, who interact with patients, to, to really recommend that patients come in for an evaluation sooner than later. So in other words, if, if patients are telling their ophthalmologist that you know, they're having trouble reading or doing a particular task. I'd rather see these patients earlier than later because they have some functional vision available now. And if it changes, at least they've been introduced to what's available to them um, at a low vision clinic. So that's something that I've kind of been a cheerleader for. And uh, it's gotten better. Um, people are making earlier referrals. Uh, the saddest thing is when you make a referral at the point where the patient is legally blind and we don't have a whole lot of functional vision to work with or not as much as we'd like to um, and and i'm just glad that they get there because uh, way back in the day when i first started doing this um, patients didn't even know that vision rehab existed but um, the earlier the better. So if you're in a position to refer patients who have any functional vision goals or who describe any activity of daily living that they're having difficulty, go ahead and um, kind of get them in the system early. And I think that's going to be really helpful for them. So I think I've covered what I wanted to cover. I know it was kind of low vision 101, the cliff notes, but hopefully there were some good takeaways from that. All right, so I, um, I'm gonna try to stop this share and do another one, so bear with me with the, with the tech and go back to, um, the presentation. Give me one second. Um, experiencing technical difficulties. One moment. Let me get rid of this thing here. We're almost there. This can go away. Let's go back to here. Okay, so let me get this back on screen as the new share. Sorry about this. And here we go to here, to there, to that. And I think that you guys are now um, back online. So Aaron, I think I'm gonna say to you, do you see now the, um, so I can get you unmute. 
Are you seeing the presentation now? Yes. Okay. All right. We did it. <laughs> okay. So that's Dr. Toomey. And um, so she's, um, she's just great. And she provides a lot of valuable information that she just did. And there have been some people who were uh, just communicating to me on a, a, a text uh, chat through this that um, they weren't able to hear her too well through this relaying of what she was saying through this connection that we have. So at the bottom of this slide, you'll see the YouTube link and uh, you can just click on that um, or go to our YouTube channel, the New England Low Vision YouTube channel and she'll be on there. So this is a live, this is something you can always access when you want to at a later point. Okay. So this leads us to the next step. Are you ready? Here, now you're going to have what I feel like is what I feel when I'm speaking to you now. It's kind of like the feeling of trying to put 10 pounds of potatoes into a five pound bag. There's a lot of stuff that's going to come at you right now. So I just want you to be ready. Um, but when we begin with low vision, I would say, you know, what happens when people come into our door is you have an emotion and the emotion is um is is one of uh what am i going to do and we said it what am i gonna do and so i want to focus on those words for a second because if you're not if you don't have the right um accent on the word it can just be very flippant, like, what am I going to do today? And very light. But this is the cry. It's like, you know, when, when you're, if you were ever alone and abandoned, maybe your car broke down or something happened where a major tragedy happened in your life and you go, you know, it's that, what am I going to do? It's that deep, dark feeling of despair. And I feel that a lot of our clients are in the state of, what am I going to do now and um their life has changed a lot of people who are coming to us have recently lost vision uh, after having it for many years and that feeling of feeling helpless is there and so that feeling of feeling helpless is and i have a couple of pictures on this and one of them in there is that uh, goldfish in that in that bag of water and, and the water's running out, what am I going to do? And so we want to do in this presentation is kind of meet that emotion. I wanted, if you guys weren't aware of it, I wanted you to make sure you were aware of that emotion because you really have to acknowledge the emotion of it all uh, anew with every, every person that comes in, um, in your presence, and then begin to work with them and taking the emotion and turning that fog into function. So there's a little bit of like, okay, you know, I know, I know where my next steps are. So some of the other images that came up is, I may have mentioned it in the beginning is that it's, it's the wandering raft or the wandering boat in the ocean. You're, or you're that low vision Island. It's just, you're just, where am I going? It's, there's nothing around. I don't know what to do. I can't drive anymore. I, I can't work. How am I going to work? How am I going to access the computer? How am I going to do all my stuff that I do every day? I just don't know what to do. And so it's through the course of this presentation and the course of what we all do as uh, helping people come from fog to focus, to function, is provide that kind of yellow brick road and uh, help them out to navigate the course forward. So who knows what we start with? Dr. Toomey mentioned it, and it's probably one of the most overlooked characteristics of vision loss. So if you can think of the word that she mentioned, it's going to come up on screen in a second, but I wanted to, I wanted to really start with this one word because it is that important. And we have a long conversation about this one word. Here it comes. Lighting. Um, so lighting is a big deal. This thing this thing called lighting is affecting everything. And some people are very, um, you know, the bright light is too much. I know that in our showroom here in Worcester, we have changed our lighting structure to take off these uh, overhead fluorescent lights and use the side lights. And people love the lights going off and dimming it down. So you have to have a conversation with your clients, as Dr. Toomey mentioned, about lighting. 
And one light, and I'm, I'm going to talk, just forgive me for saying these types of words. You need, like if, you, if you're playing basketball, you need a basketball, all right? If you're going to go running, you need running shoes, all right? So I'm going to talk like that. You know, I, I don't want to sound offensive, but I'm going to talk that way just for the sake of our time to help break through any preoccupation so that you can go back and look at it and just know that this is coming from, from our experience that you need, you need this stuff, all right? The person needs a desk light, as Dr. Timmy mentioned. The, the person needs a floor light. It's task lighting. It's a, at a perpendicular angle. Uh, some of the two more popular ones, I'm gonna mention these two. You see them on screen. One is Verilux, the other one is Stella. So these two floor lights, um, these two lights, one's a desk light, one's a floor light, are very popular in New England. I imagine they are throughout the country. Are they the only ones? No, they're not. I bought them both for myself to try them out, and I use them both. You know, I have a desk lamp uh, near a chair and uh, next to um, a bed, and then I have the floor lamp next to a, a, another favorite chair. Uh, the Stella lamp, I like that a lot, just so you know, because it has an extremely bright and broad light. And it has a rheostat, so you can adjust the intensity of that light. So um, the Stella lamp is something that I recommend. It also has a remote control, and you can easily turn the light from a white light. You need a really bright white light. Most lights that we use are not bright white. They're an incandescent yellow hue. You wanna change that. All right, and you have bright white light, the brighter the better. And then what's nice about the Stella lamp is you can adjust the intensity with that rheostat control so that you can make it a brighter or dimmer white light. You also can change the colors from a, um, a white to a, that yellow color or to a blue color. So you have a lot of flexibility with lighting. And as Dr. Toomey mentioned, sometimes that's all you need. And so if you start right there, you can save your clients depending on what level they are at vision loss. Uh, a lot of time, effort, and energy just by introducing lighting. And um, lighting is huge. So I want to make sure you know about lighting. Uh, some of these things, uh, you know, I want to make sure you know, there's not one place that gets, that can, that can provide all of this stuff. So, but you'll find most of these things right on Amazon. So um, just search out Verilux Light or Stella Light, and you'll see a lot of suppliers for those lights. And uh, they're very useful. And I would say that's, those are the majority of lights that are offered by the doctors, by the uh, nonprofit agencies, by the VA hospitals, by the state governments in New England. So I want to make sure you guys knew that. It, you probably already know that, but if you didn't, now we all know lighting, lighting, lighting. And uh, those are two or the more popular ones. Okay, so next, how to clear the fog and get functional. This is also something that Dr. Toomey threw in there, which is extremely important. The important question is this, what is the goal? That separates one client from the next for us. Um, a lot of times we have either mom or dad coming in here and with their uh, spouse with them and a son or a daughter or both. And uh, each of them have different goals for their loved one who has vision loss. That's not, you know, you need to have the goal of the person. The goal is the separating factor. I never know where an appointment's going to lead because I never know, um, I don't confirm the goal until we're right there in front of them. And once we have the goal, then we have a direction. We've all seen these types of stores before, the Home Depots and the Lowe's types of store. These are mammoth stores, right? These are stores you walk into that and you go, whoa, I almost need a, <laughs> I almost need a, 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 a golf cart to walk around these stores because they're so big and massive. They're filled with a lot of stuff. And these are a good example to a degree of what it's like trying to navigate low vision, uh, trying to get clear the fog and get functional. It's kind of like walking into one of these stores where there's so many options, so many directions, and you don't know where to go. And what defines the path where you want to go? It it's answering that question. What's the goal? So if you go on a Home Depot and you don't know what the goal is, you're wandering. 
But if you say, you know what? I'm going to be building a deck. I need a hammer. All right. Now you know where to go. Now you know the goal. So you want to get that bullseye. You want to identify where that is. And this is the first step from moving from fog into function is clearly identifying the primary goal. You know, I ask, I tell people you now in kind of in a conversational way when they're in, in with me, I said, you know, if you wanted, if we had to define one goal that you wanted to do, what would it, what would it be? And so, you know, invariably, you know, I want to be able to see again. I want to be able to see the way that, I, the way that I used to. And we kind of have to kind of move past that because the reality is we can't bring back the vision that was lost. So I said, okay, now, you know, we can't restore that vision, but if you had to prioritize during the course of an ordinary day for you personally, what are those things that make you go, ah, you know, I wish I could just do, uh, and, and fill in that blank. Is it writing out check? Is it managing the finances? Is it, is it working with your hands on crafts or hobbies? Is it playing a musical instrument? Is it watching TV? Is it all of the above? We have to organize and prioritize the goal because there's not one piece of technology that can do all of them. So we ha and they're expensive. So we have to identify which is their primary one uh, so that we can answer those needs and that cry in, a, in an orderly fashion. Okay, then we want to also identify and introduce the fact that we all live in two worlds. What I'm gonna tell you next, you already know. And when I tell clients this, they already know it. But somehow putting what I'm gonna say next into words that we all can use as common language really helps to organize and clear the fog and get functional. So here are the two words. There are two worlds that we all live in. What is the first world? The first world is the digital world. So we have to know how to navigate and function in that world. Those questions have to be asked. The second world is the non-digital world. These are the two primary worlds that our clients live in. And those are encapsulating our entire conversation. The goals for solving the fog of the digital world, the goals for solving the fog of the non-digital world. The non-digital world is uh, also called sometimes, we refer to it as the paper world. So it's the, the things that you can hold in your hand that are physical, that are tangible. Uh, these are some of the things uh, that are in the paper world. So let's go back to the digital world. What is the digital world? You, we all know this, but it's worth saying. The digital world are your electronic stuff. So your, it's, your, it's your computer, it's your tablet, it's your phone. We all have to interface with that in one level or another. So we're all answering emails, we're answering texts, we're watching videos, we're surfing the internet, we're managing finances, um, we're sharing photographs, we're all coordinating schedules, we're all accessing our online logins. How do we navigate the digital world if you can't see it? All right, that's got to be a question. How do we solve that? We've got to check that box and make sure we're doing that. So another, uh, another example is the TV. How do we see the TV? Um, so uh, the other one is the, um, the voice activated uh, digital worlds. So the voice activated digital worlds are things like Alexa. Oh, I said her name. She's going to speak in a second behind me. I'm going to call her, for, if I refer to um, her again, I'm going to call her Lady A so she doesn't talk back to me. So when I say Lady A, you know that means the Amazon lady, okay? So Lady A, and there's also the Google, the Google, the Google uh, Home uh, pod. So there's a number of other ones too, but I mentioned Lady A because she's probably the most popular. Most people are familiar with her. Most people have um, uh, the Amazon account. Most people have Prime. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. So it's a very good way to interact uh, with your gesture of voice. This is all a part of the digital world. Um, what is the non-digital world or that paper world? Um, these are things that you're all familiar with, but it's good to kind of put them up there. Bank statements. How much money do I have in the bank? And I, I get, you know, if you have stocks and investments and you're getting all of these monthly statements coming back to you, it's, you know, how do you access them? They're pretty small print. And you want to know, is this a, a faulty charge, your credit card statement? I don't know about you, but I'm always checking it going, 
who's that charge from? You know, did I make that charge? Oh, oh, that was that gas station when I was traveling here. That's that name. I have to go search it up. So other ones are like, no, I can't explain this charge. So I, looking at your statements is a big deal. How do you do that if you don't have it electronically, um, which would revert us back to the digital world? Then there's things like mail. That's extremely important. Who is the mail from? How much is this bill? Um, is it junk mail? Another thing is the newspaper, still very important. Not important for me anymore. I don't read the newspapers. If I want to get news, it's online, right? But a lot of people, especially seniors, are still reading newspapers. I want to read them. And um, what's the common thing they want to read in the newspaper, in the local paper? The obituaries, right? So that always comes up. Um, newspapers, then there is that stack of papers, the old filing. How many of us have files that we just... We would like to organize one day. Well, a lot of people who are seniors, which are most of our clients, they want to organize their files and they're getting new medical information to reorganize the files. That's a big deal. These are all paper accessibility, non-digital um, um, applications. Then there's the pill bottles. I mean, how do you read these pill bottles? These are really tough to read. One is the expiration date. Is the, is the medication even expired? How much do I take? Um, then there's the restaurant menus and of course, um, photographs, uh, photographs is probably the one of the most enjoyable things for people to view. And with you have vision loss, you can't even see them. So, um, these are just some of, they're not all of them, but there's all I could fit in a crunched, in a crunched slide, uh, on one slide, but there are many more examples of the things that cross our eyes during the course of an ordinary day at home or at work or both. So let's go back to tips. Um, the digital world, we'll start there, then we'll move to the non-digital world, the tips. So what do we do? What do we feel that by extension, we feel that you ought to do um, to consider doing is to kind of imitate some of these things or, um, if you can let me know, maybe the things that we're missing, we'd always like to know that. But we want to first say, okay, so we want to access your, your Mac or your PC um, or your Android or your iPad um, or iPhone. And so the one thing we want to do is take advantage of all the Mac or PC accessibility functions that are already built into the device that you bought. And invariably, it's, it's so often, I can't believe how often it is, people don't know about them. Um, they may have seen the accessibility folder, they might have heard about it, but they haven't activated anything. So we want to make sure that we are um, activating the accessibility functions of the PC, of the Mac, of the iPad, of the Android, so that you can make it more accessible. Um, before we go into some of these things, I want to make sure that we also mention the next thing is if you're using a Mac or a PC, I highly recommend a 32-inch monitor or bigger. It's good to say it. Most people don't have it. Um, most people are using a smaller than a 20-inch monitor. Most people are stuck on their laptop monitor. I like get off your laptop monitor. I, this happened again just a couple of days ago. I was with a senior. He was using a Mac on a laptop. You know, had significant visual impairment. And I'm like, whoa. So two things I did with him without going into any of the uh, electronic video magnifiers for the non-digital world is I just showed him on his own stuff, his own Mac. Number one, I said, I highly recommend you get at least a 32-inch monitor. Now, I want to let you know why I say that. Me, I don't have vision loss. I have natural vision loss with this, uh, if you can call it natural, but age, my age-related vision loss has to do with that I'm over my 50s and I, my eyes can't accommodate close up. So I have these cheaters uh, that I use. And little funny story, little tangent here. I went to the doctor about a month ago or so. And uh, as a new doctor, they gave me out these packet of forms to fill out right there in their office. And I took the packet of forms and I sat down and I had done throughout my entire life. And I sat down to fill out these forms and I could not see a thing. I was totally blind to these forms. I, it was, I, I, I couldn't function on them. So I got right back up and I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't see any of these forms. Do you have a pair of cheaters here, by the way? 
And sure enough, they had brought out a, a little can. They had like four or five pairs of these uh, cheaters that you can get at you know, CVS or Walmart or whatever. I put that on and that was my functional tool of uh, helping me get through that task. And then once I had those on, that was it. So with me, what I use for a monitor, I have two 32 inch monitors side by side. I can't tell you how good that is. Uh, we all have resources. We all spend them on different things. If you have the resources to get two 32 inch monitors, I highly recommend it. If you have the space word on your desk, make, you know, I can move some things on my desk. Yes. But it's really nice being able to hold up. I don't know if you're like me where you have a lot of applications and windows open at one time. I have my email, I have my text, I have my internet. I have my, uh, my, uh, my Evernote that I use. I have, um, you know, I have a number of different apps, calendar, uh, open at one time. So when I want to be functional at my workstation, I have, I want to have all these things open and I have them displayed as like four large monitors because of the way I arrange the, the windows on my two monitors. And it's really helpful and functional. Okay. If you go to YouTube and many of you know, this guy, uh, I don't have a slide on him, but I'm going to mention him. His name is Sam from The Blind Life, it's L-I-F-E, The Blind Life. Uh, Sam from The Blind Life is visually impaired. He has central vision loss and he, and he um, puts out videos on his opinion of all the technology in the market and also different things that work for him. Does he use two 32 inch monitors? No. What does he use? He, use, he uses one 43 inch monitor. All right. Now, Sam from the blind life um, is also the one who is editing his own videos. So he's working with the software. And so he's, he's doing the videos as we're, we're doing a video now, but he's also editing them. So he's, he's in the weeds of all of the clicking and pointing and dragging and uh, editing of that video. So he uses a 43 inch monitor. The 43 inch monitor is also very good. And I have to say that recently I purchased for my home office because I wanted to try it. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this one day. And I finally did it because of Sam. I bought a 43 inch monitor. So I have at work the two 32 inches and at home I have a 43 inch. And they're each different, but they're both good. And sometimes I would, let me say it this way. When I had a 32 inch monitor, the first time I put them on two 32 inch monitors, all of that visual data was confusing. It was too much information at one time. It was like, it, it felt uncomfortable, but after a week, I loved it. So I wanted you to hear that from me is that I love it. I love the two 32 inches. And I was thinking even, you know what? I would like two 43 inches. Like that's just that's just way over the top. That's just, I would, that would be too much, right? Two 43 inch monitors. So I'll at least try the one at some point. So I bought the one 43 inch just to see what it's like for Sam. And for someone like him who has central vision loss, he gets that really close to the monitor, probably about two or three inches away from the monitor. Um, but he's able to see a lot of information on screen at one time. Now, if you have a, a client who's using a small monitor, and I'll, I'll, I'll just do this simple example. My, a Mac that I'm using right now, it's called a 12 inch screen, just for the sake of math. And you go to a 36, a 36 inch monitor, three times bigger. Then that print is three times bigger at the same size. So before you even access any um, accessibility tips or tricks within your accessibility functionality, you just made your screen bigger. So the bigger monitor for the digital world is helpful. And so I recommend that you consider recommending to your clients a 32 inch monitor or bigger. And um, it has worked for me, it has worked for the, um, I haven't found one person to come back to me and said, no, I wish I didn't have this 32 inch monitor. It's, it's nice. So it's, I would say at least a 32 inch monitor. I hope that if any of this gets picked up by any of these manufacturers that we represent, that these electronic video magnifiers would be a little bit larger at some point in the monitor. They've been 24 inches for quite some time now, but we'll see how that plays out. Okay, the next tip. 
The next tip is huge, huge. All right, so I wanted to slow down and just emphasize these three things, these things slowly because you might know them, you might be using them, you might tell your clients, but 90% or more don't even know them. Okay, let's start with the PC. Uh, with the PC, what you wanna do is, um, and this is on the newer PCs, probably in the last year or two, the latest software, which most people tend to upgrade their software. If they don't, you might need to go into an accessibility function. But on the latest PC, if you're using a PC right now, you can do this, all right? Hold down the Windows icon key on the left-hand side of your keyboard. And then as you're holding that, uh, tap the plus button. And then the universe of your screen gets bigger. And, uh, my mother, who's just turning 80, she's a young 80, but she uses a PC. I can't convert her yet to the Mac. I'm trying to convert her, but I can't convert her. She just likes, she is stuck in the ecosystem of the PC. If I change that PC to a Mac, it would just rock her world. So I'm, I'm sensitive to that and to, now I'm a convert to the Mac. I used to use the PC for almost all my life, except for the past seven, eight years. And I really like the Mac ecosystem. It was a change, but I wouldn't go back. And so I like to share what I'm doing with other people and uh, changing my mother's world from the PC world ecosystem to the Mac world ecosystem is too much. So I showed her this one thing probably about six months ago. And you would have thought I have given her a brick of gold or you would have thought I would have come to visit. <laughs> she loves when I visit because I don't visit as, as much as she would like. It was amazing. She was so happy about this. Your clients will be so happy if they don't know this one piece of functionality about the PC to make that screen bigger. It makes the entire universe of the screen bigger. What I mean by that is not just one window, but everything. So you can now drag your mouse up and see the file drop down, all of those drop downs on the top of each of the windows. You can see where to point and click. Um, it's extremely helpful. Who uses this a lot? The guy I mentioned before, Sam from The Blind Life. So use that PC Windows icon, uh, as the Microsoft icon on your PC, I mean, and the plus and minus key, press and hold and tap, 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 either the plus or the minus for getting it bigger and get it smaller. You also can use it with, the, you can do it with the mouse once you put it on, uh, but I think it's much easier with key commands. All right, but on the Mac, what do you do? The Mac does not have it automatically activated. So the Mac, you do need to go into the accessibility functions. This was the guy who I just mentioned before, who I met last week, who was using a 12 inch Mac laptop. And I showed him, I, I said, you know, get a bigger monitor. That was my first recommendation. And when I showed him this thing, he had about the same reaction as my mom. And I just met the guy. He, he was so elated. He almost didn't, he, he couldn't almost stop doing it. He couldn't believe what this particular tip did for his life. And so what you need to do is go into, you know, it's system preferences. And you have to go into accessibility. You have to go into Zoom. You have to turn on the key identifier and turn on, um, I think it's defaulted to the control key. For us people who are Mac people, change the control key to the, to the command key. And it's the same type of movement. You hold the command key down and you use your mouse, either the trackpad or your mouse, and that makes the whole universe of your Mac bigger and smaller. Boy, did he love that. And I would say that I tell that to almost everybody who tells me uh, that they wanna have greater accessibility on their computer. All right, so we don't get into any software you need to buy yet. This is all stuff that you can do on your device that you already paid money for, you're just not using it, okay? So these are two critical functional tips for helping to access, we're still in the first world, the digital world, okay? Your clients will love this. If you're already doing it, you know how much your clients love this. And it's a joy to me, and I know it's a joy to you to show someone this and seeing that feeling of, oh, wow, this is amazing. 
So um, that's an incredible tip that I, I hope that you take with you. Um, the next thing is the iPhone. Again, this goes back to my emotion and my passion that you heard me in the, in the previous tips. This is something that I am so surprised that people don't know how to do, that they're not using. So I know you guys, most of you know this, all right? So here's my iPhone. I think you guys can see me, I'm holding it up. When I tell them, when I ask them, if you turn the magnifier on on your, I, on your iPhone or your iPad, it's the same thing. They said, yeah, someone, uh, my son or daughter, they made the text bigger. And I said, no. <laughs> Not making the text bigger so you can see your email. I'm saying to turn your iPhone into a magnifier. To turn your iPad into a magnifier. And they're like, huh? I said, okay, let me just see. And so uh, invariably, I would say upwards of 90% of the time, it's this feature is turned off. It's a feature inside the operating system or they call it the iOS, the operating system of your, um, of your iPad or your iPhone. So you have to go into accessibility, into the Zoom and turn it on. And then once you turn it on, it's the triple click, either of your home button or the triple click of the side button. I don't have a home button on my um, iPhone or iPads now with the newer versions, they don't have it. You have the side button, triple click, and that instantly turns on a magnifier. Years ago, when the iPhones came out, you had to go download an app. Some people still have apps, depending on who your client is. You don't need apps. Uh, it's built into the operating system. Get rid of the apps. It's much easier to access. Um, you can do a lot of the things, if you're familiar with portable video magnifiers, um, electronic ones, that a lot of the portable video magnifiers have. So sometimes my um, suppliers, like, you know, like, I wish you wouldn't mention this to your clients because then they won't purchase a portable video magnifier. I was like, you got to mention this to clients. Now there'll be some, there'll be, uh, not some, there'll be many seniors. It's just too much. It's too much to handle. Um, it's trouble holding the, the, the iPhone steady. The union of standard support, but we always have to lead with what's the best for the client. And this is an incredible tip, an incredible functionality. I have to say that personally, I use it all the time. You can easily put on a light. You can easily change the backgrounds. You can easily freeze the image. You can easily enlarge the, the image. You can easily save the image or share the image. You can do so much with it. It's just a fantastic functionality already inside the device that you have. So make sure that you're turning that on. Um, the next thing regarding the functional tips for the digital world I want to mention in a broad way are apps. We're going to go into some apps in a little bit. I'm going to name some apps that you're going to want to know. Um, one of the ones that I just want to mention right now is Seeing AI. That still tends to be a fairly popular app um, that's made by Microsoft for the iPhone. What? So does, I, does Microsoft make it for the Android? No. What? So we're like, yep, it's made by Microsoft. It's a free app. You know what free means. Nothing is free. They're getting something, they're getting information to, and hopefully it's helpful information to make the uh, functionality of the app better. But with the seeing AI is really good for a lot of things. One of the things that people use it a lot for is turning text into speech, um, a portable text to speech reader. There's also a color identifier, a money identifier, a scene identifier, a person identifier. I held it up to my wife uh, who had just turned 50. And it says, sitting in front of you is a woman who is 30 years old, 20 years younger than she is. She goes, I love this app. <laughs> so the, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fun app and it's also functional. It's one of the ones that's pretty fairly used. So I want to just mention seeing AI because it is free. I like to use, who doesn't like to use free, right? So it's a free app um, that you can use. There are, others, there are other ones that are not free. You have to pay a fee. Um, but uh, that one is uh, being used. So that's, the, that's one of the apps. Okay, so let's say you've turned on the accessibility functionality of your PC and you're at, or you're using it with, um, uh, you're using the accessibility functionality of your Mac. And let's say you're on the PC and it's just not enough. 
if you're on the PC and it's not enough, then um, you have to go to the next step. All right. So first explore what's already in your device. What if it's insufficient? You still can't see it. Then you have to go to what's called Zoom text. Zoom text I'm mentioning because it's just, it's, you know, it, it, it's like, an, you have to mention Kleenex for tissues. It's like, it's, it is the brand. It, it's, it's worldwide. It's the most dominant large print magnification app. Um, and then if you're, if you're in need of, a screen reading software to turn your computer screen if you're either totally blind or at a point of vision loss where you can't access your, your computer screen, you need to have your screen turned into voice so you can hear it, then that's called JAWS. Um, and then the combination or the fusing together of those two is fusion. Um, other ones I just put up on screen are Supernova and VDA. Um, so these are some other options, but the predominant ones almost in all of this, the federal government, state government, nonprofits, uh, schools, uh, they're, everyone is using the ecosystem of ZoomText, JAWS, and Fusion. There are some with Supernova, there are some with NVDA and other ones, but there you were getting down with far fewer percentage rates. Uh, I would say it's upwards of about 95% on, on uh, ZoomText, JAWS, and Fusion. So for our trainers, we have to know everything but predominantly all of the trainings on those ones, all right? So let me just go over Zoom text. Uh, you know, why would I go to Zoom text? Now, Zoom text, JAWS, and Fusion, they do have free 40-minute downloads. Uh, it will time out after 40 minutes. You have to restart and redo it again. So you can download them for free and try them for free, but after 40 minutes, the software is prompted to say in the pop-up menu, want to buy it, want to buy it, want to buy it? And so you gotta go, okay, so I gotta go turn it off and reboot it again and try it again. Uh, but it does allow you to try it for 40 minutes. Um, if you're here in New England listening to this, we are the only distributors of this software for Vispero or Freedom Scientific, the same company. Uh, so with us, you will get a discount. So if you want to try this, go ahead and try it and download it from them. But if you wanna buy it, um, if you buy it from us, you will get a discount. So Zoom text, um, I wanna let you know um, let me get, go a couple of things about the firepower of Zoom text. So if, if these things are helpful to you, then Zoom text might be an answer. What does Zoom text do? Well, a couple of things it does is number one is it can make your mouse bigger, which you can do on your laptop or a PC or Mac without Zoom text, but it can make it a little bit bigger, the, the mouse pointer. It can, you can also turn on this functionality where it gives you a crosshair, a left and right or a perpendicular uh, horizontal and vertical uh, crosshair that meets right at the point of your mouse. So this crosshair follows wherever you move your mouse. So for someone who's visually impaired, they always know where their mouse pointer is, all right? That's a pretty neat piece of functionality on Zoom text. Another thing you can do fairly easy is split your screen in a variety of ways where, for example, the top half of your screen is not magnified. It's the full width. So you can see the perspective of your entire screen, but below cutting the screen in half, that part is magnified. So you're always seeing two screens at once uh, to help you know uh, where you are. You also can take, um, you know, if I hold up, I'm gonna hold up one, I'll, I'll talk about this, something like this later, but a handheld magnifier has a lens kind of like this that I'm holding up. You can turn your mouse area into a lens, kind of like a digital lens where your whole screen is normal size, but where that lens is, that area is magnified. So there's a variety of functionalities like that. There's only a few of them um, where if the built-in magnification functionality of your PC is not sufficient, then this is the next step, okay? Um, if Cortana or the screen readers of your device is not sufficient, then JAWS is kind of the next step, all right? These are expensive. Uh, JAWS and ZoomText are about, you know, JAWS is about $1,000, ZoomText is about 700 
Um, there are some deals that they work through the American Printing House, so check it, check that out. But uh, they're they're expensive softwares. Uh, they just this this whole field is expensive. That's just what it is, unfortunately. And that has to do with because the field is so small. There's a very small amount of people buying the um, the technology and the software. They're not sold in every Walmart. They're not sold on all the Amazon links. So if they were mass distributed, that would drive the price down. But since they're not, the price has always been high because it's a small market. That's just the laws of economics and supply and demand. So um, this, these are some of the things for the, um, the apps for um, um, and the Zoom Text Jaws and the Fusion, the Supernova NVDA. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to mention about that. And that was, oh yeah, the Mac. Uh, Zoom Text, JAWS, Fusion, NVDA, Supernova, I do not believe any of them work on the Mac. Maybe I think, I think Zoom Text and Fusion did in the past, but they don't anymore. Apple's pretty proprietary in their software, but the good thing about a Mac is you don't need to buy any other software. They have a built-in uh, quote unquote Zoom Text or Supernova. And it's called magnifier. You have to activate it. So you have the accessibility functionality built into the Mac operating system already. You just got to activate it. And you can customize all of those um, functionality and features any way that you want. Same thing about, you know, for a PC, you want to, if you, if you can't use the basic stuff, you go to, you have to buy JAWS. For a Mac, you would use what's already built in, but not turned on. It's called voiceover. So... A lot of you already know that, but you know it's good to have this conversation with your clients uh, just to help them navigate, we're still in part one, the digital world. You have to solve the digital world and everyone's gonna be solving it differently, but you have to review some of these things. Um, but voiceover and magnification and all this functionality, what does it take? It takes time to learn it, right? So um, you know, people hire us to train them. Uh, there are some nonprofits uh, that have social services where that service is already paid for. Um, the, it doesn't cost the, co the consumer anything. So uh, we always say we're the last step. If you can find um, a federal government uh, who has services to help train you on this stuff, um, the state government, nonprofit agencies, or some, sometimes there's grant money that provide training services. What you're really paying for is the time that it takes to, to train you on these things. It just takes time. So the enemy is time, you're paying for time. So if those um, resources are not available, then people hire us for training time to train them on things that you can do yourself. But sometimes it's just a lot easier having someone show you how to do it and walk you through the steps. And so we might, be, we might get hired for a one training session and then they can, like it's like riding a bike. Once you show you how to ride the bike, then you can kind of ride it. Some people hire us back for different, um, different training sessions, always based on the goal. Okay, so all of these things that I've mentioned so far are things you can do by yourself, things your clients can do by themselves, or if they have a son or a daughter, usually if they have a grandson or granddaughter, the younger, the better, they can show grandma and grandpa. Uh, usually they, they just eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff almost right out of the womb, how to use this electronics. So um, family members and friends and surrogate others can help out um, in a big way on this information, which is free, uh, most of it, except for the, you know, the Zoom text and the JAWS, if you get to that point. All right, the last one I want to mention, I'm going to say her name, you see it on screen, I won't say it, I'll call her Lady A. And uh, there are so many functional tips with this lady. Okay, or the other competitive smart home devices. I recommend highly, because there's so many, that you Google the top 20 things. A, you know her name, Lady A, can do. Then do the top 20 cool things you can do. The top, the top 20, you know, the, uh, Google is, uh, sometimes I think it's organized to, if you, put in the top things as the word top, top five things, top 10 things, top 20 things, then, then Google or whatever search engine you're using tends to come back with a pretty valid search to get you in the right direction for videos. 
And then you see people on really good videos who that's the, almost their job. And you can make a lot of money doing videos uh, is to make good videos, all right, on these things. But there are so many things you can do with, uh, with her. Let me just tell you one of them, drop in. For those of you who don't know this, and I'm sorry to repeat my, uh, if you know this and it's just, you know, first grade stuff, but my mother-in-law who, uh, before she passed away, she was in her eighties and she was declining. She's still living at home, independent, but declining. And, um, um, she has the old school phone. I think it was still rotary dial. Was it rotary dial or no, I may have been push button, but. She'd talk, you know, she'd talk to her friends and then she'd hang up, but she wouldn't hang up the phone. So we're like, okay, we check in on her every night um, and we call her and 99% of the time it's good, but in a couple of times it's like, it's busy. All right, she's on the phone. Call back in an hour, it's busy. Two hours, it's busy. So we finally got into setting up for her Lady A and setting up the drop-in feature and my son set it up. He was at that time, 11 years old. Okay. 11 year old set this thing up. All right. It's pretty easy. So he set it up to pair with our, we have lady A at our house. And so we said, lady A drop in on Nana. Then her device goes bong. And we know, and she has to give us permission, which she did, which of course, that's a big part of it. So make sure that you, your clients know this. So if it's a son or a daughter, that's, that's an easy one. Uh, with, with, uh, with Nana, it was easy. She's like, yeah, let's do it. So we dropped it on her and um, went bong. And so once we heard the bong, then we know that she can hear us. And we said, Nana, is everything okay? And she's like, yeah, uh, yeah, everything's fine. Why? We're like your phone's off the hook. Hang it up. Oh, it's off the hook. I didn't know that. And uh, she went over and she hung it up. That's okay. Well, I got to tell you, that happened at least six times. And two of those times, she fell. So two of those times, it was extremely helpful. We got medical people there, helped her up. Um, and, you know, when people who are elderly fall, it was a, it was, it was a lot of work. It was rehab. But you know, how long could she have been there? The, the, the Lady A, that feature drop-in helped out a lot. I mean, a lot. So we would be hired to set up drop-in or you can do it or your 11-year-old can do it. Um, you also want to put in their contacts because now you can say, Lady A, call my daughter. Lady A, call my son. Lady A, call whoever, all right? You can make phone calls using ADA. So this is all the digital world. And if you have vision loss, so helpful, so helpful. I mean, I don't know if you're going to see it here, but I'm going to do it for the sake of the people who are in the room right now. I'm going to say her name and do some light activity. It might show up. So look at my, see if the room changes behind me. Um, it probably won't because the lights are on overhead, but I'm going to say, Alexa, light blue. Alexa, lights yellow. Alexa, lights white. Alexa, dimmer. Alexa, lights dimmer. Alexa, lights brighter. Okay, so you can do these things with lights. It's so, I mean, how many times you're sitting down watching TV and you go, ah, the light's on, it's providing the glare. I got to get up again and I just sat down. You just now use your voice. This is control the lights, right? And now you can use Alexa, you can use her to, uh, you can use her to control your TV, security, lighting in the hallway. You set up routines. You know, you can say, Lady A, perform the bedtime routine. What does that mean? Turn the thermostat down to, 65 for sleeping, automatically do that. Turn the lights out outside the house, automatically does that. Turn the lights out inside the house, except for that one, they'll do that, all right? Lock the doors, all right? Um, so you can program these routines with this technology. 
So I don't want to underestimate, and that's why I'm highlighting in here, the extreme usefulness of um, Lady A and the smart homes, all right? And what does that incorporate? It incorporates the enemy. What's the enemy? Time. You have time to set it up, all right? So if the family and friends have time, you can give them all these tips and just, you know, say, hey, get your grandson, get your granddaughter involved. This will be a fun project when they visit. It's easy to do. It's fairly inexpensive. Um, and it will just rock their world. It will change everything. So I want to make sure you see and hear me and my passion behind these functional tips that I hope that you're using and advising your clients of. And you know, now you know that we're doing that here at New England Low Vision. Okay, let's go to spend a little bit of time on app tips. And, um, and so let's go through some of them. You ready? This people have found to be a very important app, a very important slide. Not that they all aren't important. I mean, those slides are pretty good, I thought. But um, I don't know why. This is the apps just kind of like, it's like catnip, right? App tip is like catnip uh, to, a, to a cat. Is uh, We had a, a presentation and we, we, uh, we dubbed it, we named it uh, Apple Picking uh, to know the, the, the top apps. So I want to say something. And, and as I begin this, because we're going to go through about 20 apps. Uh, number one is this slide, this, this presentation is available. So you don't have to write down all these apps. Or when I'm all done, take your camera and do a screenshot, you know, a snapshot if you want to do that, if you want them quicker. Um, all of these apps, what's, I would say, um, you know, when you, the adage, like when you buy technology today, it's outdated tomorrow. When you know the top 20 apps today, they're outdated tomorrow. All right, apps are always changing, they're always being upgraded. Your needs change, your world changes, apps are always changing and your needs are always changing. So these apps, while relevant at one time, may no longer be relevant now. Um, we are gonna be posting our opinion um, for 2022 of what our trainers feel are the top apps. So that's coming soon. Um, but right now, I'm going to list some apps. You ready? And we'll go through them. So I want your mind to just kind of be aware of these apps and uh, communicate these types of categories to your clients as well. So Ira and Be My Eyes for Sighted Assistance. If you haven't heard of Ira, A-I-R-A or Be My Eyes, what they do is look through your phone, kind of like FaceTime to a remote somebody, a remote person somewhere in the country, and they can help you with sighted remote assistance looking through the camera on your phone or with Ira through a camera on a pair of glasses. Ira is subscription-based. So you do have a fee to pay. Be My Eyes, I think, is still no fee. Um, at IRA, they do have partnerships with some major organizations in the New England area. I believe it is Wegmans. I think Wegmans is nationwide. Um, I believe it's um, Logan Airport and there are a variety of other ones. When you go into these establishments, whatever subscription you're paying for the number of minutes that you're using that month, they, are, they don't count when you're in these establishments that have these contracts um, as a free gift to their patrons when they use their, um, when they're on their property. So Ira and Be My Eyes, those are some, um, those are great apps for sighted assistance. And now we're going to go further. Here we go. I can't spend a lot of time on all of them. But I'm going to try to name them and we can always go back to them. Zoom for video conferencing, Instacart for grocery shopping, Seeing AI for optical character recognition. We mentioned that before. Lyft and Uber for ride sharing. Uh, Proxima IT for public transit tracking. Microsoft OneDrive for cloud storage. Microsoft Soundscape for travel orientation. Fidelity mobile apps for mobile online banking. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing this the right way. Lazarillo for GPS info and navigation, the Nest for home thermostat control, 
Anybody using the Nest or something like that? Those are pretty cool to upgrade your thermostat control using your voice. Uh, Apple Podcasts for podcast access. Podcasts are really, you know, it's kind of like this. You can call this to our time today a podcast. It's just information that's really helpful to listen to when you're kind of traveling um, and learning different tips that can help your clients. Netflix for described video programming. Bard Mobile for audiobooks. Voice Dream for text to speech of documents and books. Probably one of the most used ones for educators with students in school. Eyes Free Fitness for exercise. My Chart for medical communicating. Uh, the Alexa app for mobile access to Alexa. Nope, she didn't say anything. Um, Amazon for online shopping i robot home for automated vacuuming so these were helped to these were assembled publicly and uh promoted by uh ashley um and nick over at the carroll center for the blind here in uh in massachusetts so uh these apps are several months old a lot of them are still relevant and there are probably uh, other ones that have taken their place but i thought this was a good listing of apps for um, you to just have some categories in your mind. They're not all the categories, they're just 20 of them. Um, and the next person might have a different 20, all right? But apps are very important for digital world accessibility. Okay, remember, how are we getting functional? How are we clearing that fog and getting functional? Remember, there's two worlds, right? What do we spend a lot of time on? the digital world. So I hope that you're spending a lot of time on the digital world with your clients. It takes time. When people come to us, we have at least a two hour meeting with them. Uh, so it really is a slow methodical um, experience to help them to digest and absorb these steps to think about and to take and how are you gonna take them? Uh, what we're gonna get into is the non-digital world, or as referred to it, the paper world, okay? Um, let me just see that I thought, give me one second. Okay, so we have a, a couple more slides then we're going to, I think, take a break. So the paper world functional tips. So, for the paper world, so just make the shift in your mind, all right? We're in digital world, electronic stuff. Let's leave that world, box it up, put it to the side, all right? Clear the table. Now we're going into the non-digital world or the paper world, all right? If you come into our showroom in Worcester or our satellite one in Connecticut, or if you look on our website or any other website, that has electronic video magnification, um, that is the primary solution to the paper world, all right? So the paper world solution is electronic video magnification. I wanna have a little bit of caveat to that, but I would say ballpark, 95%, all right? We're gonna get into some delineations in a minute, but I want you to see that when we go into the paper world accessibility, electronic video magnification is the answer. And when you are in the world of electronic video magnification, uh, video magnifiers, and sometimes they're referred to as, and I hate these words, CCTVs. So we try to never refer to them as CCTVs. Why? Because if you Google CCTVs, what's a CCTV? It's a security camera. Uh, this name has stuck with the in our field um, because I guess at its heart, all of these video magnifiers also are using a quasi security camera inside it. So that branding of CCTV stuck, but it has it's a very bad descriptive because people don't know what you mean. They think you mean a security camera. So we like to say video magnifiers or electronic video magnifiers, um, but that's what we're in right now. So we're in the non-digital world, the paper world where the solution is, all right? 
and I said before, you're going to need, if you're playing basketball, a basketball. If, if you need, um, um, if you, if you need paper accessibility, you're going to need electronic video magnification. Um, but there's some delineations and I'll get to you in a bit. All right. So when we're in this space of the paper world, you can organize all of it. Remember that past uh, slide about Home Depot and Lowe's and uh, how confusing all those technologies and products and sizes and shapes and, uh, you know, was just dizzying. That's the feeling our clients have when they see technology. It's just dizzying. It all looks different and all the same. But you can organize it all into two primary categories. What are the primary categories? Number one, portable. All right. Everyone needs, 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 needs a portable magnifier. Okay. Can it be, I'm holding up the uh, iPhone now. Can it be your, your phone? Yes. But it's got to be something. All right. You do need um, something to carry around with you. Um, the portable video magnifier is good for what? the portable video magnifier has a good thing about it and a bad thing about it. The good thing about it is that it's portable and being portable, it's small. The bad thing about it is that it's small. Why? Because the smallness of the monitor doesn't allow you to have a lot of information on the screen. So what is the fundamental benefit of a portable video magnifier? The benefit of that is to reach short bits of information that are important to you right now when you're up and about and on the go for you to make a decision. What does that mean? What does the thermostat say? What is the price tag? Who is the mail from? How much is the bill? What is the expiration date? Uh, what is the prescription number? What is my credit card number? What is the three-digit code on that credit card? All right. What is the microwave cooking instruction? Do I poke holes in the film? Do I keep the film on? Do I take the film off? How long do I put it in there for? Do I have to turn it over or mix it up? You know, this all this micro print that we're that we're living in right now. I just set up uh, a, an upgraded uh, ring doorbell at my at my home. Well, the micro print on this manual it was like micro micro micro. It was you need the you needed a video magnifier if you had 2020 vision to see it. So small bits of information when you're up and about and on the go, that's important to you right now to make a decision. Uh, restaurant menus, even the, uh, and then shorter reading tasks. Where does a portable video magnifier reach its limit? Uh, it reaches its limit when you want to do more productivity tasks, longer reading tasks, longer writing tasks, want to be more functional at work, more functional at home. Um, that is where you want to kind of go to the next thing, which is the next uh, category of the two categories, which is a non-portable electronic video magnifier. The benefit of a non-portable electronic video magnifier is it gives you a much larger magnification strength on a larger monitor. At our office, I think it's the world's largest magnifier. We have a very large monitor, it's a 75 inch. We can make newspaper print 250 times original size, okay? That is the answer to a degree is magnification. You have to make the things bigger. But the problem is on the portable one, it can only be so big before the information goes, it fills the screen. So the non-portable gives you a bigger screen to allow you more information on screen to reduce this back and forth movement. So you're reading what's on screen. A lot of people can read just what's on screen when they magnify it. It reduces fatigue and increases your reading speed. It makes you more functional. So a non-portable video magnifier is for productivity tasks. A portable is for spot information, reading things when you're up and about and on the go. Almost nobody can use a portable for writing. 
as soon as I say nobody, I find the one or two who can out of the thousand. But it's very cumbersome using a handheld magnifying glass or a hand or a portable electronic video magnifier for writing tasks. If you have, depending on your visual impairment or depending on your age or your uh, dexterity. So I would say that upwards of 99% cannot use a portable magnifier for writing. So a non-portable is very easy. There's a little bit of a shift on how to do that with how someone's used to writing, but it's very easy. People all the time, it's, it's always amazing to see people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, use this equipment after having uh, been used to writing for one way their entire life and they change it to use a, an electronic video magnifier to do all of their writing tasks. So a non-portable is productivity, a portable is non-productivity. What are the, what's the category I did not mention? Wearable, all right? I do not see wearable as a primary category. So the paper world, if we're organizing into two categories, it's portable and non-portable. That's really easy. That's really helpful for your clients to know the two categories because that really separates and organizes the path forward. It helps them to get out of the fog and into focus. Do I have a portable? Yeah, I do. I'm using my phone. All right, I don't need to buy an electronic video magnifier. Do I have a non-portable? No, I'm using my iPad. I know that's working for now. Okay, I know that. Let me see what these things do here while I'm in your showroom. And, oh, that can do that. That can do distance viewing. So there's other things you can show them, but it's good to organize the two solutions into those two categories. Let's talk about wearable. Wearable is probably the one category that's the most popular. Wearable makes the phone ring. Wearable is, I'm sure, something that your clients are asking you about. Um, it just is. But what, as Dr. Toomey said, you know, after she was speaking for a while, she said, after I advise my patients about all the different options and things that are available to them, they come, they come back to me and she says, the patients say, yeah, but you're still gonna give me a pair of glasses, right? And that tends to be the place is that wearable are kind of like, you know, people in their mind psychologically think that there's a pair of these wearable glasses are gonna be magic glasses. And you would not believe the amount of time that we take uh, taking people's expectations, which are so high, and bringing them down and in line with the capabilities of the, of the wearable. So we want to always define realistic expectations and primary goals. What is the primary goal of a wearable? It's distance viewing. Can it do other things? Yes. What's the primary goal? Distance viewing. It's like taking a, a binoculars and looking out in a distance, right? Distance viewing. As soon as that's one of your primary goals, then we're good. Then it can do other things. Can it do intermediate viewing? Yes. Can it do near viewing? Yes. But there's you, it's different and it's not as easy as maybe some of the ads make the wearables look. People think they're going to walk around with these wearables. We're like, uh-uh, you can't use a wearable for walking. I saw it in this picture. The person, you no, know, they, some of them can flip up. They call it a pantoscopic tilt. Uh, other ones you'd put on your forehead while you're walking and then bring it down when you get to your destination. But they are not for walking. They're not for driving, of, of course, but not for walking. So, uh, we're, we're, telling these, we're telling these couple of tips about wearables to, you know, that's the primary question, wearable, wearable, wearable. Uh, that's the one category of technologies where we do not do a home demonstration because we've been, we've been bouncing around everywhere showing these wearables and people are like, oh, that's it? I thought it was something different. <laughs> that's what we've been trying to tell you. So we make, after a long methodical, exhausting sometimes phone call of 40 minutes to an hour or longer about these technologies on the phone after that phone consultation and information and links is provided to them, then we require the, the client to drive to one of our showrooms for a demonstration on all of the wearables. We happen to have them all at, at our 
at our in our company. So um, that um, that that's a kind of like that is the situation on a wearable. If you think of tools in a toolbox, like a hammer, a hammer, a pliers, a screwdriver, portable and non-portable are those primary tools. And this is how I explain it to clients. This is these are the ones you're going to have to go to on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of do stuff. A wearable is not a primary tool, in my opinion. Um, I do have, just so you know, there are, of course, suppliers and doctors um, that we work with who try to get the wearable to do the one thing for everything. It's very difficult to do. Um, so in my opinion, a wearable is not the screwdriver or pliers or hammer, but it is that tool that's in the garage or in the shed that you bring out for an important project. So let's name some wearable applications. Watching TV, that's one of the big ones, okay? And there is one wearable, and I'll name it when, I'll, I'll name it now, Vision Buddy, that's really helpful for watching TV. And we'll get to that when we go to the, um, that point in the presentation. Um, another thing for wearables that's pretty important is seeing people's faces. I mean, just the facial expressions, uh, even Tracy uh, on our own staff here, who's visually impaired, uh, she doesn't mind me saying uh, these things that she's revealed to me. Uh, she has a wearable and she really enjoys those two things, watching TV with her husband with a wearable and um, watching the faces of her family when they're gathering at her home and seeing when they're opening gifts or seeing how they're interacting. There's a lot of, you're, you're missing a lot when you're not seeing how people are reacting with their faces. And so that is, those are two important um, pieces of life. And if that's important to you, which for a lot of people it is, then that's worth the price of a wearable for those things. Um, then it's for any distance business meeting or gathering. So church, um, a religious service, a business meeting, um, a PowerPoint presentation. We had a doctor who bought a wearable for, um, he was no longer able to, he was a cardiologist, not, not able to practice, um, surgery anymore, but still went to conferences around the country and would use a wearable to see in the, in the large gathering room, the giant screens that are at a, quite a distance. Uh, when he's sitting in a room filled with a uh, hundred or so doctors hearing a presentation from one of the speakers. So you can look out at the speaker. You can look out at the big monitors while sitting in your chair in the audience and look at your presentation in your hands too. That's near viewing. So you can look at it some near viewing. Um, so presentations, uh, anything at a distance, vacations involve a lot of distance viewing. So different events and presentations while you're on vacation. Um, also playing cards, that's kind of intermediate viewing. Reading sheet music, that's kind of near viewing. Not everyone can read sheet music at a, at a magnification where they can see all the notes that they want to play. Uh, one person wanted to use a wearable for reading sheet music for uh, playing a tuba in the marching band. Can't do that. Okay, too much bounce, you can't, you can't follow it. Um, another person, uh, what was his name? I, I, he was a very um, famous uh, jazz, not jazz, celloist. Ah, I'm sorry if people know him and I'm mispronouncing his name. I think it's Bernie Greenhouse. I hope that's his name. I'm sorry if it's not. Uh, he was once a client of, of ours. He was just, he's a legend. He's an icon. He used one of the wearables. Uh, to help teaching his students prior to him passing. Uh, he had a, he had a um, I think it was a 300 year old Stradivarius cello. Uh, so he used a wearable to help seeing the sheet music. I think he is also, he, I think he said to me, he helped, he, uh, at one time one of his students was Yo-Yo Ma, uh, but he lived in, um, in, in Cape Cod here in Massachusetts prior to him passing. But you can read, some people can read sheet music with it. Um, can you curl up to a book and sit down and read a whole book? That primarily is, I think, what most people think you can do. I would say that from our experience, for most people's magnification needs, 
extremely difficult. So we really want to put it out as the primary application is distance viewing. And then once we kind of check that box, then we can kind of back into other things that it can do. I mean, a couple of things, there had a person who was a, a high school mom who had a superstar softball daughter and uh, she had central vision loss, the mom did, and she couldn't see her daughter play from the stands with a wearable she could, okay? Other people, uh, one person I remind of had season tickets to UConn basketball, all right, distance viewing. Uh, there's a variety of distance viewing tasks that are important. Another person wanted to see their daughter get married. Um, so that's the first row of a church. The, the, the wedding vows are probably on the altar of, in the sanctuary about 12 uh, feet or so away. And the wearable was helpful for providing that up close experience for uh, his daughter getting married. So there's some, I find that wearables tend to check the box to do the thing or two that's really important. You know, when I buy a, uh, this uh, iPhone or a lot of my devices, I buy them because they can do many things. But a wearable I find to be purchased because they can do the one thing that a portable and a non-portable can't do. All right, so that's wearable. And the last thing I wanna say, as I mentioned it before, are smart homes. So that kind of rounds out the organization and focus um, for, um, uh, for the, um, the non-portable. We're coming up on a break in a second, just a couple more quick things. Um, what is the point of readiness for electronic video magnification? All right, why even look at it? Like why even check it out? Why? What's that point when you wanna do that? And um, the point is when your handheld magnifier, so I'm gonna hold up two of them. When these handheld magnifiers uh, that I'm holding up, which are very common out there, when they're not providing uh, two things, the one thing is not enough magnification. It's frustrating getting the magnifier on the word so up close that I'm trying to imitate that right now. And you're so close and you're kind of tracing the words and it's just, you can't, your, your hand's tied up with it and you really can't be functional. So if it's not providing enough magnification um, or not enough field of view, width, not enough information on screen, those two things are the point of readiness. If someone says to me that their handheld magnifier is providing enough magnification and enough field of view, no problem. You don't need us. You don't need electronic video magnification, all right? Um, so it, it's way, you don't need it yet. It's just too early. So that's the point of readiness for, a, that's a really good guide. And usually it's about when your magnification strength need is just approaching the 5X, 6X threshold. All right, these ones here, uh, there's about three and a half, four X. Most of the popular ones that are being purchased are about that size. When you want more magnification, you all know this, I know, but laws of optics, very large lens, very weak power, very small lens. Think of a jeweler's loop. When they look at a diamond ring, a very small loop very strong power, very small lens. Laws of optics, bigger the magnification, smaller the lens. Bigger the lens, smaller the magnification. It's just kind of funny. I know you've experienced this too. Mom and dad have vision loss. Grandma and grandpa have vision loss. What do this family wants to help out? They go to Amazon, they go to Walmart, they go to CVS, they go and find the biggest lens, the magnifier, thinking they're helping, thinking bigger is better. Bigger is not better in terms of optics. It has the weaker magnification. People tell us all the time. They ask us to probably ask you too. Don't you have this like piece of magnifier thing you can just, you know, put over a whole newspaper so I can see it? And, uh, and the yeah, amps, no, <laughs> there's not something. You know, there's this Fresnel lens that covers a, a TV and it's just very distorted and it maybe gives you 2X and it's very hard to see. So it's just the laws of optics are the bigger the magnification, the smaller the lens. 
And the smaller the magnification need, like these ones here, the bigger the lens. So those ones are useful. So about 5x, 6x is usually the starting point when a, a video magnifier is needed, but that is uh, the point of re readiness. And then just as we come up to the break, uh, the strategy for low vision, we tell this to the clients too, magnification. This is the strategy. Magnification is the answer. People will often say, you know, they might put a video magnifier, they might be up to it. You know, I still can't, you know, it's kind of blurry. I, I can't see, I can't make it out. So then what I do, I make it bigger. Can you see that? Oh yeah, that's, that's good. Whenever you hear that cry, I can't see it, it's blurry, it's too small. When I was in the doctor's office trying to read those papers, as I mentioned before, it's too blurry, can't see it. And I make it bigger. So this, I'm putting this up there because this is the answer. This is a key. Is it the only strategy? No. Is it one of the key ones? Yes. You have to make it bigger, all right? The handheld magnifier is not doing the trick. Make it bigger, get a bigger one. You get a, a handheld video magnifier. That's not doing the answer. Make it bigger. Get a, a, a bigger video magnifier. That's not doing it. Then maybe a bigger TV set with a, with a magnifier that, connect, that can connect to a bigger TV set. If, it's, if the vision is too far advanced or though even that, then it might be more text to speech to hear and process information with your ears rather than with your eyes. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing um, is we're going to be assembling a toolkit in a few minutes. Um, that's gonna be the, um, the primary solution for the non-optical. Uh, we have, our time is going by much faster it always goes by fast. We're trying to cram things in. But on that note, what I want to do now is just kind of have a 10-minute break. So um, we're going to put a little bit of a pause. And um, the time now, I believe it's just about 11 o'clock. So if you all could come back at 11.10, 10 10-minute break, a little bit of a pause, and we'll resume with um, some more strategies uh, then. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Let me see if I can get out of here. Um, yeah. Okay, someone's giving me tips, which is good. I like it. <laughs> um, so let me just think. If I want to come back here, let me turn this this this.
think she called Gary or Dizzy or something. She's like, oh, I'll just try this. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you for your, your time and your attention to this. And I um, want to pick up from where we left off. This is going to be more interactive right now. Um, so for those of you who are um, able to hear me, I think, Aaron, let me, let me take your microphone off mute. Um, Aaron, stay on with me, if you would, because I want to make sure you're hearing me. And then I'm going to go to um, bring the uh, share screen to uh, the presentation. So bear with me one second. And let me just go over to here and share that screen. And so I think that, um, give me one second. I think we're back to the 10 minute break. Correct. And is that what you're seeing, Erin? Yes, where to okay. begin 10 minute break. All right, okay. So everybody, welcome back. And I wanna let you know that this part, as I was mentioning, is gonna be more interactive and it is going, um, if, you have a, if you have the ability to also search the internet while, um, while I'm speaking, I'm gonna be referring to things on the internet. Um, and so to help direct a course forward. Um, for those who are here in the room, then they'll see it on the big screen here. But uh, if you're at your, at your place of work or home, um, you might like to follow along as I tell you where to go uh, to see some of these things for yourself, okay? So where to begin? Where were we when we left off before the break? We were right here at this slide, is that you need to assemble your toolkit, okay? So this is primarily, Remember, we started with, just to review, we started with the digital world, and then we moved into the non-digital world. So we're assembling our toolkit um, for the non-digital world, and we'll blend in some other things as well, okay? So where to begin? Let's see if I can get this slide up. Give me one second. What I would ask you to do is to look at the top devices on nelowvision.com. Where do you go to find that? You have to go to our website, click blog when you get there. Uh, then, and I have it pointing there to the blog area. Then you wanna click top choices. I have a pointing to where that will be. Then you wanna click the top 10 low vision aids for age-related macular degeneration for 2021, which would be over there. Now there are a lot of top 10 lists there and I'll, I'll go over them and why this is a help, an extremely helpful tool um, for you and for your clients. You, know, you don't have to show them our webpage, you can copy it down and use it and, and make it yourself. But um, we have organized here a lot of the top products in a variety of different forms and fashions, and the lists are all different. Um, so I want to start with the first page, which is the top 10 list for age-related macular degeneration. And what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to stop this screen share. Um, and let me see if I can go out of here to share this screen here while I'm actually on the site. Okay, and we're here. And let's go to share this screen. Give me one second. Where is the share screen? And we wanna share this screen and we're back here. So, um, so, Erin, I want to make sure you are unmute you. Are you seeing my screen, which is the website? Yes, we're at the top 10 low vision aids. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I'm not going to go back and forth from the PowerPoint to the internet. So we're just going to follow along on the internet 
uh, step by step as I'm looking at the slides here. So the where to begin is this first one. So I want to let you know about this one. Uh, this we do every year. We're going to have a new one in 2022. Um, but this is a collection of almost all of the leading manufacturers in the market today. Uh, could there be some that we're missing? Yes. I, I don't know who they are, that what will be replacing one of these, but um, all of the leading manufacturers um, on the market today are what the team is looking at when they select this list. So this list is selected by um, in part me, in part the members of our team and trainers uh, based upon our experience in the field. I have about 30 years and there's a couple of people on our team have almost 30 years and 20 years, uh, 10 years, but there's a lot of experience behind these. We also have data as far as popularity. Um, so we kind of mix it into our opinion based upon our experience. Um, and logic from what we're seeing, we create these top 10 lists, which some stay the same with little tweaks, others change uh, pretty dramatically based upon new information. So let's start with this list because why I'm mentioning this is as a place to where to begin is that most of our clients, if you're like me in New England, a lot of our clientele demographically has suffers from age-related vision loss, most prominently macular degeneration. So that tends to be upwards of 80% of a lot of our conversations, um, what to do with macular degeneration. So this comes into then a collection of all of the wearable, all of the portable, all of the non-portable, all of the technologies are clustered here into the top 10. So this is a top 10 list of all of them together. Okay, so the first one here is I'm mentioning, I'm going to click on it, and this is the DaVinci Pro, and you should see that populate on screen. The DaVinci Pro we have on there, as, I'm not going to go through all of them, okay, but I'll go through just a few of them. The DaVinci Pro is probably been the number one product on our top 10 list for almost the last five years. The DaVinci Pro, if we were going to categorize uh, products as good, better, and best, which sometimes our minds do automatically. The DaVinci Pro we have found to be um, the best of the best. Are there other ones that are similar? Yes, and we'll go through them. There, uh, some of them are on there in different ways. But the DaVinci Pro has been kind of the standard bearer for somebody who wants a productivity machine for reading and writing that's totally solid, it dependable, it's accurate, it's easy to start with, with someone who is, um, has no computer experience, no technology experience, and you can always add one more piece of functionality and step to it. Um, going back to my mother-in-law, we were teaching her um, the iPhone or the iPad, and I, it reminds me of the DaVinci Pro because like, like an iPad, for example, she didn't know how to touch it. She didn't know how to swipe. She didn't know how to tweeze. She didn't know any of that stuff at the time. And so we helped to teach her how to do that using a game called Tic-Tac-Toe where she could tap it, uh, she could swipe it, she could tweeze it, and she could learn to interface with an iPad. So I mentioned this simple activity for my, um, my mother-in-law, tic-tac-toe on an iPad, because some people are that rudimentary, that beginning stage for the technology. But as you know, with an iPad, you can do many things with it. And I would say that in contrast to what my mother-in-law was doing, our company uses iPads. And we almost run our company on iPads and apps and you know, where trainers are out in the field, they can type in information to the iPad. And when they're at, and then someone at the office here can see in real time, the notes, right? So we can help process information. So we have a lot of calendars, a lot of apps, a lot of note-taking, a lot of repositories that we're accessing through the iPad. So you can almost run a whole company on an iPad, or you can start with tic-tac-toe, very simple. Similarly with the DaVinci Pro, by way of functionality, you can start very small with a dial in the middle and just make things bigger and smaller. 
then you can add, then you can do distance viewing, near viewing, really sharp, clear, crisp optics, uh, really accurate OCR. If you want to get into the text to speech, if you want more computer functionality where you want to save images and save files and port the files, you can do that too. But you have a lot of that built in functionality for almost any reading task, any writing task. So this is the, the type of technology for someone at their workstation, uh, not for school, not for middle school, high school at school, but yes, for middle school, high school at home. Yes, for college at home, if they're as, or the dorm. Uh, yes, for someone at working from home or yes, for someone in their dorm at college. Uh, yes, for um, anyone who is a senior working at home who still is very actively managing the affairs of their life. You, the DaVinci Pro, if I didn't mention to you the DaVinci Pro when you were talking to me and you ended up with some other technology and then you found out about the DaVinci Pro and that I had it here to show it to you, you would really be mad at me because it's just one of those products that has been like old faithful. Can that change tomorrow? Yes. You never know. You never know who suppliers are with this world as it is that uh, the new, I'm making this name up, the new Johnson rod that is being used to control the gizmo inside the unit that makes it work so well, found a new supplier and that new piece is now bad and now it's not working and unreliable. That could happen. That happens in other products and can happen in the DaVinci Pro. I don't know how many times your iPhone, an iPad from the world's richest company and these are out there in the gazillions, right? These things break down and, and they need service and have a lifespan. So, but the DaVinci Pro has been tried and true and that has been a great product. So I wanted to emphasize that one as our, as a number one product in our opinion from all the work that we do with all the suppliers that we work with. The second one, I'm just gonna do a couple of them, the MagnaLink tab. The MagnaLink tab is a product that is using a Surface Pro tablet. So this is not for the client that I affectionately call them grandma and grandpa, right? This usually is not for grandma and grandpa, but this is usually for middle school, high school, mobile professional who is not wanting to carry along a heavy magnifier. They want something to incorporate into their existing technologies. That's the MagnaLink tab. Um, this is uh, using a Surface Pro tablet for near viewing, distance viewing, saving files. What I like about it also is you can use a stylus. It's very zippity, has fast OCR. Um, and if you already have a Surface Pro tablet, you can also save some bucks because they can, they, it can be offered without the tablet where you get the stand, the distance camera, and the manufacturer's software. So that is the, um, the MagnaLink tab. Uh, let's get out of here. Let's get out of the DaVinci and let's go back to here. Let's go to the Reveal 16i. The Reveal 16i is from Humanware. Uh, many people don't know about this product, but this is wonderful for uh, younger students. So younger people, as well as grandma and grandpa. This comes in two forms, the i, which is this one, Reveal 16i, or without the i, the Reveal 16, where you save $1,000. The i means it's internet compatible, capable. What does that mean? This is a desktop video magnifier that can connect to Wi-Fi. The monitor is a smart monitor. The monitor is an Android tablet. So you can connect to your Google Drive, uh, your online accounts through the Android ecosystem that you can access right through your CCTV. It has a distance camera and a near camera, really sharp optics. It has text-to-speech OCR and it's collapsible and foldable. So I'll just click on some of the pictures here, uh, different, some of the displays of how this is set up. Um, and I know you can do this yourself, but I'm just gonna show you and we'll get to some of the collapsibility of it. In a second, there's a student using it and there's the back of it, the camera at a distance viewing. This is how it's collapsed down. So 
This is the Reveal 16i, has a four hour battery as well. And it's, I would call it not uh, portable and not non-portable. Well, if it's not portable and it's not non-portable, then what is it? So if portable is on the one side and non-portable is on the other side, it's in the middle. And what do I call that? <laughs> Luggable, all right? So this one is luggable. And um, this is great for kindergartners, first grade, second grade, third grade, even a little higher, who are just getting used to a CCTV. It has really nice big buttons and who are just getting used to the internet. Uh, it is touch screen as well, it, or you can use a stylus. We're just getting used to learning how to use a distance camera and a near camera. So it has a lot of multifunctional, multifunctional uh, capabilities. We also have a number of seniors who are using this to access the internet. Uh, not a large number, but it's several of them. Um, if you do not want the internet Android monitor, but you do like all the other functionality, then it would be the Reveal 16, not this one, the 16i, and you save $1,000. So those are three ones that, are, those are three on the list let me exit out of here and just go back to that list. Other ones you'll see on there, the Ruby XL, the Explore 8, the Vision Buddy is a wearable. The New Eyes Pro 3 um, is a lightweight wearable. So you have a number of different categories on this all kind of inclusive list. And this is a springboard. That's the main point here to begin a conversation with your clients to create a road, the yellow brick road of some function what do I do? You know, what do I look at? What do I consider? This is before you see anyone like me, no matter where you are in the country or the world, uh, anybody who has technology, you want to look into these things and find out their features, their benefits, their pricing. And now you have a list. All of these are linked to the product page. Or at least you can see at one glance, a number of items that are highly recommended. Uh, there are some where we can, we attach a video. Other ones we're working on videos. We're not in the video business, uh, but we're trying to get videos up there as much as we can. But this is a really good starting point. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide, which you're not going to see, but you're gonna see the result of it. The next slide is, I'm gonna say it um, verbally, is you wanna go to the top portable technology again, where you were. Um, and this is the, this is the New England, the, uh, our website, click the blog again and then click the top portable electronic video magnifiers for 2021. So in the previous one, we had the top vision aids for age-related macular degeneration. Now we switched it to new list, to new starting point, to new springboard, to new path, if that is the kind of the, the area where you wanted to provide some focus, uh, click the blog, click, uh, electronic video magnifiers for 2021. Make sure it's 2021, look at the year. In a short amount of time, you wanna look for 2022 because that's probably gonna be changed and then within this, but by March, all right? We're gonna have a new list um, up there for 2022, which will have some new options. Okay, 2021, what tops the list, probably the most popular product of all of our manufacturers so far, if you combine them all, is the Ruby. Now, when I say Ruby, the Ruby has at least four different types. Uh, now five, now seven, because different colors now. So of all the Rubies, the most popular one by far is the Ruby XLHD. It's a five inch. So I'm gonna go click on that. And I don't know what it is about the Ruby. Um, you know, and if you're if you were a Marvel Comics person like my son is, you watch Iron Man, and he has hot rod red for Iron Man as a, as a color of choice for Iron Man suit. Something about the red color, whether it stands out on the desk. When we had people independently know nothing about devices, have an, an experience like coming to our place and have a lot of consumer choice, invariably the Ruby is selected. Um, it has a tilted screen, which is big. And I want to say another thing, which is huge about a portable, and I don't know why anybody would use a portable without a handle. It has a handle. How do you use a portable without a handle for looking at a thermostat? 
um, or looking at a price tag. It's so hard to grip and grab, especially for people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. So portables need to have a handle. Uh, the Ruby XLHD has a handle and a tilted 45 degree angle. The tilted 45 degree angle, which I'm showing here, I can't really see it there. I don't know if there's a good picture here of the angle of it. Uh, you kind of see it there, but it's on an angle so that you can, you can just not hold it. And it creates that constant focal length and it's very easy to use and operate. So the Ruby XL has been our number one. Uh, what's creeping up on it? Uh, I would say the Explore 8 and the Explore 5, which are up there too. Uh, Explore 8 is number two, Explore 5 is number four. And these are from Humanware. These are also very popular uh, portable products. There's a little larger screen. What just came out, which is not on the list now, uh, but it came out after the list was made, was the Explore 12. The 12 inch version also comes with a stand which makes the portable a writing tool. Um, almost all portables are not writing tools. When you have the stand with the, with the Explore 12 inch, it's a great writing tool, not as expensive as a traditional non-portable desktop video magnifier like the DaVinci Pro, but it's a somewhat lesser expensive option, uh, maybe about $2,000 worth, worth versus $4,000, and you can use it for writing. A limited form of writing and a limited form of distance viewing, the Explore 12. This is the Explore 8, which is an eight inch version. This has no stand. This is not the best for writing, neither are any of the, wear, any of the portables, but these are on our top portable list and you'll see um, that this will change as I mentioned this coming year. And, um, also not on there is the new Ruby 10, which will likely be on it this year. The Ruby 10 has an extended arm that shoots out. And um, let me see if I can pull that up. I'm just gonna, if you wanna get any of our products, go to the search field and type it in, Ruby 10. Boom, and whoop, whoop, there it is, Ruby. Whoop, sorry about that, there it is, Ruby 10. So Ruby 10 has this little external side camera, which now their hand is awkward there, uh, probably for the photo, but you, you would sit right in front of it and just put your hand forward to write. So you can do what that person's doing, but if, <laughs> that photo is kind of odd because where she would be or he would be sitting, you would be uh, not looking at the screen. So it's like, well, I don't get that one, but um, anyway, but you'll be sitting in front. That's a nice feature for writing. And this also has text-to-speech on it. Text-to-speech is not a popular function on a portable, um, but uh, some of them do have a limited, you know, a DaVinci Pro, for example, on a one to 10, their text-to-speech is a 10. Their optics are a 10. On a Ruby 10, I would say the optics are close to a 10. Text-to-speech, not a 10. It's maybe probably about a... Uh, you know, a five or a six, which is kind of pretty good for a portable, but it all depends what the priority is, what's the goal. So this does have a limited text-to-speech, uh, but this is really helpful for writing, which writing is a big thing for people who want it and you really can't do it on a portable. So if that's important when you're up and about and on the go, then Ruby 10 is nice because of that extended arm. Okay, we're gonna get rid of that one here and you just go back one link here and go back there. Um, all right. Those are some of the portables. Oh my gosh, I see the time just cripping away. So what I'm gonna do now is go to the next one and the next few fairly quick. And I apologize for my speed, but we're just gonna rip through these things and you can go back to them later. Uh, you wanna go to the blog section and then click top desktop electronic video magnifiers. So where the first one was all of the categories, wearable, portable, desktop, these are all the desktop, all the non-portable all the list and you'll see the DaVinci Pro there is on top and all the other ones that are really good. The Merlin's really popular uh, in New England, probably dominates the uh, marketplace for state government, federal government. It's the Merlin HD, 24 inch. It's old, reliable, three-year warranty. Then that's the big brother is the Merlin Pro with the text-to-speech. Then you have the touchscreen ones, the Topaz OCR, the Clearview C plus speech, the 
Onyx OCR, all of these things are really good for uh, desktop video magnification. Moving on to the next slide, we have computable, computable, computer compatible technology. So you wanna go to click blog and then you want to click on the top 10 products for 2021, soon to be 2022 for schools and educators. So if you want the computer one, we don't say computer, we would say schools and educators because a lot of the schools and educators are the primary buyers of the computer compatible technology. You have the Magdalene tab there, which I mentioned. We have the transformer there. We have the 16i, which I mentioned before. The Acrobat Mini is tried and true. The Magdalene Zip is very popular out there at schools. Ruby 7, Magnalink S can work with a Chromebook, very popular at schools, DaVinci Pro, lower on the list here, but still there. Um, we also threw in the Braille Note Touch Plus 32 and the Topaz Ultra. Uh, that's the same thing as the, uh, the old um, Vizio book from Bomb. Remember that one from APH? Well, the Topaz Ultra or the Merlin Mini are the new, the, the, the identical product. So that, that got discontinued and got resurfaced under new names. So uh, those are the ones for schools and educators. Then we're gonna go to the top wearable. Uh, so it's, you know, it's the homepage, click blog, click top low vision wearable glasses. And those shows you, those will show you the new wearables. We're also adding to that very soon, the Idaptic i4 and the new one from Iris Vision called the Inspire. So it's really nice if you're in New England to have a repository and a place to show people the wearables after they're qualified, after they know what it can do. Um, but you do have uh, a lot of these wearables uh, available in a list form. And then again, the links to their product page to get more information, to get a video, to know their pricing, and uh, you have that all in one spot. Uh, the next top 10 list, um, if you have clients, is you are wanting to go to, uh, it's called the blindness technology, the top blindness technology. So what would you do here? You'd go to newenglandlowvision.com, which is this page, right? I'll go back to the main page and wait for it to load there. Come on, load. Okay, then you wanna click on technology. Now watch this. This is a nice feature. It's featured product categories. Cause now you're like, instead of kind of like info dumping every technology in one item at a time, we have categories. So here, if you know you want embossers, you can click on embossers. If you know you want low vision glasses, low vision glasses. I already introduced you to where the top 10 lists are, but these are the different categories. What we want now are blindness products. So we can go not blindness accessories, but blindness products, right? So we click blindness products. And then once we're here, if we scroll down, you can see there's a lot of uh, products here and then a number of pages, right? Well, then we can use the search tools. So I wanna introduce, introduce you to search tools. So we can sort by price, high to low. Uh, let's do that, boom and then it should sort them. We don't probably want, want that. Let's try low to high, different sorting, right? And then what we wanna do is sort by, um, well, we're already on blindness products. Then we sort by manufacturer. Uh, let's just do humanware, boom. So now you have humanware products from low to high. So you have a lot of different searching tools on this website after you are introduced to the categories on those, like there were 12 tiles before. So that's how you wanna get to organize the different blindness products and provide a path and focus for your clients. All right, moving on, we wanna to go to functional resources. All right, so let's go here first. So how to get there, resources, functional resources tips. First one is smart homes. In this section on top where the mouse is now, you have resources. This is extremely valuable. All right, so let's go to, I thought it was here. Am I not seeing it? Why don't I see it? Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry. It was blog. Blog first. This one is blog first uh, for the smart homes. So it's blog. And then over here, instead of clicking top technology, we click smart homes. Okay. And then you get to all of the information repository articles um, on smart homes. You can also you know, do the whole Google thing, as I mentioned before, the top things that Lady A can do. We hear of a lot of articles. We try to put it all together in our little smart home repository of things to kind of get the brain rolling on smart homes. We can always call us for a quote on smart home training and create a path forward if you're in the New England area about where to go with a smart home. Uh, what I jumped ahead to, which I'll circle back to right now, is if you want to go to resources, I was mentioning how what a, a good um, uh, repository of resources this is. The first one I'm going to go to is the uh, ebook. So we're going to go down here to now what ebook. We put a few things together. These are free, all right? These are free information. If you want to buy the book, we have to print the book. We have to charge it for you. But I wrote the book, um, and it gives you the top things you do, the path forward of all the professional resources that your client needs to look at. What's number one? Ophthalmologist. What's number two? Optometrist. And on and on and on. We go occupational therapist, the low vision um, a rehab therapist, and all the different professionals, the TVI and where they're important in your consideration, the, the VA hospital, the state governments. And um, I, would also, I would say that almost the last chapter of the book, it's a small pamphlet book um, that is the most important. The, the last chapter is the most important and that is uh, attitude, all right? Because attitude is everything with low vision. So I invite you to explore this book, you can download uh, one, um, one, I guess, one section at a time or uh, to download the entire PDF. And if you wanted to order it, uh, then you can order it. Uh, we just have to charge you for the printing and the shipping it out to you. So these are available for free as the primary goal because people don't know what to do. They don't know who the professionals are. They don't know anything. And uh, I don't know if you're you if in your line of work you get the same thing of why didn't my doctor ever tell me about this this technology or so no one knows the path there's no rehab you know if you break a hip and you have to get surgery there's a kind of a path forward for rehabilitation it's not it's not so the case up here uh, and with loss of vision there's not a path forward that's clear so this book helps to organize the different professions and so you can know at least you can tell do I need this. I should look into that, you know, how can no one tell me about this particular professional? So that's what the purpose of this book is, and it's free. Um, that is the, the book. The next one I'm going to go to is um, uh, training worksheets. So again, under resources, you have training worksheets right here. When you click on that, you get to this section, and these are also free, all right? These were developed by me and Chris J. Roz who is a, uh, a low vision therapist at the VA up here in New England. And uh, this is to train people how to use their desktop video magnifier for reading and writing. So you can download all three of them or the first one are uh, you know, 27 pages to help you with writing exercises. Uh, the second one, um, you know, it'll show you different things also how to, for writing, but it's using the XY table more on, on your video magnifier. Um, so, and the third one has nine pages of other different type of humorous, but also functional and useful information that helps people to use their CCTV. Like for example, the, the mayonnaise jar. We all know that story. If you don't know that story, then that's a great one to look up. It's a common story. And it just 
helps people learn and to be reminded of how of that story by reading it on a video magnifier of something they likely know. So there's different really, these are really helpful uh, functional uh, training worksheets that most people don't know about um, that are free. The last one that I wanna mention, so I can move this, this thing away over here. The last thing I wanna mention is um, on the resources, sale items. So we have a lot of suppliers uh, and what happens a lot of the time is you, um, items get either traded in or we have to, we're having that in the field and we have to upgrade them. So we have a pre-owned equipment list. It's upgraded fairly regularly. This one was not even a, a month old yet. Just almost, we'll try to update it monthly of portables and hand, all different types of video magnifiers that are sold at a discount. And I have to say they're in good shape. And uh, a lot of them, of almost all of them, if we didn't tell you they were used, you wouldn't know. So we say, this is what we think is a fair price, but what, what do you think is a fair price? So we, you know, and I would say no reasonable offer would be refused. If you tell me a fair price is $2, uh, that's not reasonable, okay? <laughs> but, you know, it's what's a fair price? So um, that those are, um, that used equipment list is very um, helpful to let your people know, to let your clients know about. Okay, so I think that is um, a lot of the resources. I'm just, I'm just clicking through my sheets here to make sure that um, we are finished with the click arounds. And now we're gonna come back to stop sharing this screen and um, we're gonna go back to the presentation. So give me a second to go get that up. Let me go back to this thing here and get rid of it. Um, let me go back to where, how do I get back to here? <laughs> All right, we're on that screen. <laughs> let me get this thing out of here first. One minute, we're almost done wrapping this up. Bear with me. Experiencing a little technical difficulties. Let's go back to here, minimize this first. Then we can get to the other one, get this one out of here, go back to the share screen. There's the share screen, go back to that slide, share that, and here we are. Go back to making this um, where we were. We, we finished all of these slides. We did top portable, non-portable, whoop, non-portable, computer, wearable, blindness, the resources and tips. Um, we went through these ones here, pre-owned equipment, okay. So now you get a head start there. You already saw it. The big tip, all right? So this is a summary of all that we said. How to focus and provide function. You have to be aware of the two worlds, right? The digital world, iOS, Android, apps, PC, Mac, JAWS. You organize these two worlds for your clients. They will be so appreciative. I'll explain to them those little tips for the computer and the, and the phones that they will love you if they don't already love you for telling them that already. All right, then go into the paper world. What's that primarily? Video magnification. Could be, uh, as Dr. Toomey said, tints, lighting, um, handheld magnification, all right? Uh, you know, other things like monocular scopes, all the things that, all the optical solutions that you would have prior to coming to video magnifiers, but primarily it's video magnification for uh, paper accessibility. And we organize in those into two categories, portable, non-portable. Uh, we also mentioned wearable, smart homes. And the thing we wanted to mention is don't forget, is don't forget about lighting. All right, so that is the most uh, important, primarily mentioned the first thing and the last thing, lighting. Okay, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll put it there for um, kind of a pause on the, um, the formal presentation. I wanna say that um, I hope, get it, let me get back to the screen here a second. Exit out of here. And uh, I think that you're seeing me now is, um, let me get this thing off of mute. Give me one second. Where's that mouse? <laughs> okay. And whoop, 
there it is, that's what I wanted. So let's go to here. And so now for all of those who want to unmute, you can unmute. Um, Aaron, uh, I think that you're seeing me right now and the, and, the, and the presentation has gone away, is that correct? Correct. Okay. So um, I was looking at the clock and I am a little bit early. So I wanted to leave a little bit of time for anyone who had any uh, questions. Um, uh, anything you want me to elaborate on or anything I didn't talk about you want me to uh, bring up and, and talk about, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so uh, I'll just pause for a moment or two and see if there's anybody who has any questions that they want to ask. Hi, this is Diane. Um, it was excellent, your presentation. Um, do you work with occupational therapists? Um, there is a yes and a no answer to that. So the answer is yes, first. <laughs> um, we love it when we have an occupational therapist. Are any of you in the room occupational therapists? Yeah, two both, right? Okay. So we I have am. an organization. I thought you were most occupational therapists, yeah. Um, right upstairs from us, who is, it's rare that you have, I think in all six New England states, uh, we don't have many occupational therapists as a group working together. So it's not a profession that is uh, heavily educated in the New England area, except for in New England, uh, Mass Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And I have a couple of occupational therapists in the room with me right now. Uh, so in that way, yes. But the only answer, no, is that I would say that in most states there is not an occupational therapist. So that's where I'm saying no, but um, whenever there is one that's available, we'd love to work with them. Okay, thank you. And do you know uh, Mary Warren? Does that name ring a bell or Beth Barstow? Those were kind of two of the names that were, I used to travel with Mary Warren quite a bit and uh, that's where I got my primary education um, in occupational therapy and low vision from attending probably about a half a dozen to a dozen of her workshops uh, throughout the country. Um, she was good at the time, her and her husband, Craig. Um, but are they still around? I haven't, I've lost contact with them, but are they still doing their thing? She was at the she University retired. of Alabama, Birmingham, but where do she occupational did. therapists go to get training now if they need it for low vision? Is there, is it UAB or? And vision? And I know that UMass here in Boston has training too with Derek Wright and his, and his team, but yeah. Oh, Salas in Philadelphia. Yeah. UAB, yeah. Any other questions? It's okay if it's no, but I just wanted to give an opportunity to ask the questions. So, well, I want to let you know that, um, let me uh, put my uh, information up there on screen again. Uh, I want to let you know that, um, um, I'm accessible, and I would say that because you are, no matter where you are, because you've met me, and um, uh, that my, my uh, the resources of my team uh, we would be accessible to you. Uh, so, you know, put us to work. We would like to, you know, we're only here a short time, right? Life is short. We just want to do all we can. Um, so, if we can do it, we'll we'll help out. So that's what we want to do. We we. I, and I say sometimes almost, I don't want to worry anybody out of my team, but you know, if the business fails, the business fails. We just have to keep doing the right thing. And if, you know, if this technology becomes outdated one day, and uh, you never know, I mean, it's changed a lot from when I started in the business almost 30 years ago to where it is today. But if it comes outdated, people don't need it because there's something else is better. Or if someone cures macular degeneration and blindness, I would be dancing, okay? But for now, it's what we do and it really helps. This technology really helps. And I hope that some of the words that I said um, help to provide additional clarity and focus when there's fog on um, providing functional, providing function for people who want a functional vision plan of how to get from point A to point B to get off that low vision island. Um, and I feel like they're that fish in a bag and the water is dripping out of it and they have no time left. and now, there was one person who does what I do in Tennessee who told me this story, and I'll close with this. 
He said to me, and this, this story lasts only 10 seconds, 12 seconds. Um, he said to me, Scott, I went up to this house and I didn't know why it looked familiar to me. And when I went inside, I saw a lady who was now 106. And I met her 11 years ago when she was 95. Um, and now she wants to upgrade. And there's just something about this work that we do that just provides hope. It provides life. You know, it stimulates those neurons in the brains. It's nice to share tips and tricks and, you know, things that work, you know. So it's, I, I know people ask me, how did I get started in this career? Do you have anybody in your family who has lost a vision? And the answer is no, that the, I didn't find the career, the career found in me. I answered an ad in the penny saver in New Jersey or New York, where I was living at that time. And um, I, I, I like it a lot. I, I would say I love it. I like, I like this field a whole lot. I like helping people through technology. I'm amazed at how the technology can help people. Uh, so we're going to try to, you know, we call it, there's two ways to go forward. Paralysis by analysis and never get anywhere. And what we do is the opposite. And that's go, learn, grow. So you got to go forward. You got to find new things, develop new ways, develop new techniques, develop new options. We're going to continue on with these functional vision workshops. Well, you'll see them posted again. If anyone from uh, with myself or anyone on my team can be of help to you, you have my information on screen. You have our websites, you have our resources, and they're going to continue to develop. So uh, please lean on us. And I thank you very much for your time. And I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. This is a great presentation, Scott. Thank you. And I, uh, this is Elsa from New Jersey. But I love how you, uh, you know, really covered all your bases, you know, really talked about what's available out there that isn't even something that you would sell just so people know what all their options are. Um, and I just thought it was a nice way to present the information. Thank you, Elsa. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>